the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It plays out on your TV screen, but how does it play out in the seat of power? In a city full of lobbies, we look at one of the most controversial. From the heart of Washington, D.C., I'm Avi Lewis. This week, we look at the power of the Israel lobby. If the U.S. is the world's only superpower, then this is the epicenter of power. Decisions made here at the Capitol reverberate in nearly every corner of the globe. This week, we focus on America's special relationship with Israel, a bond always on display in an election year. All of the presidential frontrunners have gone out of their way to affirm their loyalty to Israel at $3 billion a year, the largest recipient of U.S. military aid in the world. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict grinds on, but U.S. support for Israel is unwavering. In the past year, there's been a lively debate in this country about the influence of the so-called Israel lobby in maintaining that level of support. So, how powerful are groups like AIPAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, and does their influence make the U.S. more or less of an honest broker for peace? We talk to people on all sides of the story to find out. There are nearly 600,000 people in Washington. 535 of them are lawmakers. More than 7,500 drive taxis. And a whopping 35,000 are lobbyists. It's one of the hallmarks of American democracy that anyone, with the right relationships and resources, can make their case to Congress, from the National Rifle Association to the California Asparagus Commission. And that goes for other nations as well. Hundreds of foreign lobby groups advance their causes here. But when it comes to convincing lawmakers that the interests of another country are synonymous with those of the United States, few can claim as much success as the Israel lobby. Far from the Holy Land, these up-and-coming lobbyists sponsored by the United Jewish Communities are headed for the hill. All right. Nice. We talked about some issues that are coming up regarding um, appropriations for Israel, for sanctions against Iran. What's your take on the Israel lobby and its effectiveness? Well, I mean, I think that every American citizen has the right to lobby their congressman, just like I did today. It may be every American's right, but successful lobbying requires substantial resources. According to the Washington Post, since 1990, pro-Israel groups have contributed almost $57 million to federal candidates and party committees through a combination of individual, group, and soft money donations. At the forefront of the movement is the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, with more than 100,000 members and a $45 million annual budget. It is the main lobby on Capitol Hill. It writes a lot of legislation. It wrote, for example, the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, and it's, it actually has a lot of interns, and a lot of those interns end up in the offices of congressmen on Capitol Hill. That's the way the system works here. Those who, are, who have people that are really fired up about an issue, really care about it, are, are going to have an advantage in that system. The real debate in the U.S. is not about the Israel lobby's effectiveness, but its effect. Critics of AIPAC say that the group has hijacked American foreign policy. When you have Israel bombing South Lebanon and the uh, gov U.S. government saying, well, go for it, you know, let's go further. I mean, how can that be an American interest? While political influence is hard to quantify, one thing is clear. After decades of building relationships and advancing policy, the goals of the Israel lobby are now the status quo. The U.S. administration has a foreign policy, and they have certain interests in the Middle East, and Israel plays a part in that. So when, I t when somebody tells somebody on the Hill, support, be a friend to Israel, they're basically saying, continue to do what you're doing. Approve that appropriations this year. Go ahead and pass another res resolution to condemn Palestinian civil society. And so it translates very easily because the terms are already set. And nowhere is the unconditional support for Israel clearer than in the public statements of American politicians. I stand here today as a strong supporter of Israel. And Israel has never had a better friend in the White House than George Bush. If people in the Middle East are not sure what democracy means, let them look to Israel, which has been and remains a true, faithful democracy. When it comes to American public opinion, there is clearly an echo effect around support for Israel, 
polls show it by a wide margin. So does the political consensus shape public opinion, or do the politicians just follow the public? If Israel has 74% approval rating among American voters, the candidates m must look at the American voters and conclude that, you know, having an anti-Israel or an unfavorable uh, view of Israel might hurt them with, with the general public. Oh, wow, that's like saying that our presidential elections are responding to the uh, majority of the people. It doesn't work like that. That machine, part of that machine is creating PR. And that PR includes creating this relationship between Israel and the U.S. that's very catchy. You know, after September 11th, that became incredibly easy to, for you know Netanyahu to tell the American public as part of expressing his sympathies for the losses on September 11th that now you know what it feels like to be an Israeli. But in fact, the entire world knows what it feels like to lose family in an attack by an outside force. And so I think that that notion that they're responding to the public is not true. If there is one issue central to the Israel lobby argument, it's the question of settlements. For decades, U.S. administrations have criticized Israel for continuing to build settlements in the occupied West Bank. And yet, they continue to go up, and U.S. aid money continues to pour in. Why not just cut off funding? That's the $3 billion question. You know, as soon as you think about trying to use aid as a lever when it comes to Israel, that straight across your desk is going to come a letter from the Congress with minimum 87 senators and 87% and of the Congress saying, don't you dare. So, is there a double standard? The US has taken a hard line with the Palestinians, pushing for elections in 2006 but abruptly cutting economic aid when Hamas won those elections. There is a double standard. Absolutely there is a double standard, yes. Because the United States sees it in its national interest to support the survival and well-being of the Jewish state of Israel. For Palestinian Americans, the question now is how to respond. In recent years, the American Task Force on Palestine has presented itself as the official voice of Palestinians in Washington, trying to build the insider power that the Israel lobby enjoys. What's your view of the success of the Israel lobby? The Israel lobby is exceptionally successful, exceptionally organized, thoughtful, analytical, uh, and it is judged by its effectiveness, and certainly it has been effective. So there is much to learn for everybody else from uh, uh, what is called the Jewish lobby. But this approach has sparked a debate within the Palestinian community about means and ends and relationship to power. For us to actually build something, it can't look like the Israel lobby because our interests aren't the same. And if we get too close, we actually risk supporting the U.S. administration more than they actually support us. While Palestinians debate strategy, inside Congress there is little debate. In the 1990s, Earl Hilliard, a former U.S. congressman from Alabama, called for re-establishing ties with Libya. In 2001, he voted against a bill increasing military support to Israel. In the very next election, he found himself facing an opponent riding a wave of donations from pro-Israel political action committees. It was uh, national news. They raised uh, more than $2 million in uh, my race. Generally, about two or $300,000 is all you need in my congressional district. So anyone that got a million, million and a half or two million can uh, just use all kinds of influence to get all kinds of aid and assistance. It's been six years since Earl Hilliard left office, but echoes of the controversy he faced can still be heard in the current presidential election campaign. In 2007, not long after announcing his run for the White House, Barack Obama was speaking to a group of Democratic Party leaders when he said, quote, no one has suffered more than the Palestinian people. He immediately drew criticism from AIPAC and other groups. He later qualified his comments, apologized, and he's been on the defensive ever since. That I consistently have not only befriended the Jewish community, not only have I been strong on Israel, but more importantly, I've been willing to speak out even when it's not comfortable. I think it's very sad to see him take part in this process, but he's responding to political realities. He's not going to be accused of being, you know, biased towards Palestinians anymore. He's going to be accused of one of the greatest evils that our modern 
you know, history knows, and that's anti-Semitism. Welcome to America. This is how it is. You know, this is what we're dealing with, and this is what we will be dealing with for some time. This is K Street, Washington's fabled boulevard of lobbyists. It runs from the White House to the Congress, and if you want to get something done in either place, this is where you plant your flag. Palestinians in America are quickly learning that lesson, getting into the lobbying game and trying to shift U.S. foreign policy. Now, successful lobbying is less about the strength of your arguments and more about your political clout, and in this town, Israel has a clear advantage. So to level the playing field and hear some of the arguments behind the lobbying, we brought together two young activists from either side of the Israeli-Palestinian divide for a debate about America's role in the region. Megan Buren is a media trainer at the Israel Project, a U.S. advocacy group for Israel. And Omar Badar is a Palestinian activist with the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. So we've been talking to all kinds of people in D.C. about the Israel lobby, the role that it plays in American politics. Um, Megan, do you, is it a constructive role, a destructive role, an uh, influential role, a uh, less influent? What do, you, what do you make of the Israel? Lobbying works the way it works, but I think if you go up and down K Street, this is not just the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There's fruit lobbies, there's insurance lobbies. This is how people get their voices heard. They come to Washington to make sure that people know what they care about. And I really think, though, when you look at what Congress does and when you look at what the leaders do, I really think that they are reflecting the wishes of the American people on a whole when it comes to this issue. Yeah. I, I don't think that's actually accurate. I think the majority of Americans think the U.S. should withhold aid from the, from the country, basically, that is obstructing the solution. And I think the problem here becomes a problem of ignorance and misinformation, where people don't know where the conflict is driven. It's driven by the fact that Israel has been maintaining an illegal Israeli uh, military occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip for over 40 years now, and they have been refusing to end the occupation in favor of, of a peaceful solution. And yet, and yet all American politicians, especially in the election cycle, basically are falling over each other to declare their, their love and Absolutely. affection for Israel, and they cite American support. I think the American administration has been very open about the fact that the end game is a two-state solution, a better future for both sides. And I think if that is the end game, then then that's the right path to take. It's it's the internationally accepted solution. But can you can can you bring that about when you're clearly supporting one side in a conflict? Because that's the perception, certainly globally, of America's role vis-a-vis -vis Israel. America has not just been supporting Israel. Clearly there is support there, there is aid there, but they've also given a tremendous amount of support to the Palestinians, and we should look maybe at where that money is going. Look, I mean, let's, let's boil it down to something a bit more basic. If you look at the role that the U.S. has been playing consistently, it has been a one-sided supporter of Israel throughout the conflict. So, for example, the Palestinians have accepted a two-state solution basically officially in 1988. And that kicked off the peace process with the idea that Israel is going to gradually withdraw from the occupied territories to facilitate, to facilitate the creation of a Palestinian state. The only problem is that Israel was doing the exact opposite throughout the peace process. They were actually building and expanding settlements throughout the occupied territories. They doubled the numbers of those settlements throughout the peace process. And there wasn't any significant objection from the U.S. I don't think that this is an issue of settlements. I don't think this is just an issue of criticism. This is an issue of trying to move the process forward. And Israel consistently, not starting in 1988, but starting in 1948, has been reaching out its hand in peace to its neighbors. When you look at the way that Israel treats the Palestinians, you have basically almost four million Palestinians living in the occupied territories who have absolutely no rights, who are constantly abused on a regular basis, tortured, including the torture of children, which is documented by virtually every human rights organization in the world. Look at Amnesty International, look at Human Rights Watch, look at Beth Salem. I mean, those are not American values. Welcome back. We're coming to you this week from the heart of Washington, D.C., and we've been looking at a powerful political force in this town, the so-called Israel Lobby. So now it's the time in the show when we cover the coverage. And when you look at media coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, sometimes you've got to wonder if Americans are watching a different war from the rest of the world. Here's Richard Gisbert with Election Post. The problem with the coverage of the Palestine-Israel issue in this election campaign is how little there is of it. This week on the Election Post, the difficulties in covering a debate, the candidates 
aren't really having. The Palestine-Israel issue seldom comes up in the campaign, but when it does, the three remaining candidates speak with one voice. It's actually the only issue that Democrats and Republicans can agree on. We will not allow Israel to be destroyed by the forces of terror in the form of Hamas. I have been a stalwart uh, friend of Israel's. The Syrians apparently were putting together a nuclear facility and the Israelis took it out. I strongly support that. It's a constant one-upsmanship vis-a-vis um, uh, Clinton and Obama by McCain saying you can't get any more pro-Israeli than this. There's a conventional discourse that has been put forth as it pertains to Israel-Palestine and there hasn't been a Democratic or Republican candidate in recent years that has gone outside of that territory. Fighting continues in and around Gaza with far more Palestinians killed than Israelis. The Bush administration says it wants a peace deal by the end of the year. But in the 34 election debates and in countless speeches by the candidates, the Palestine-Israel issue has rarely been discussed. Palestinian statehood and Palestinian human rights is an issue that none of the candidates have really been addressing. They certainly established their affinity for the state of Israel. Um, none of them, however, have taken the step to say, listen, you know, what's going on with the Palestinian people is really a travesty of justice and it's something that should, you know, should be stopped. The voice of the right wing, which wants to keep a hold of all this territory, is the voice that's heard. And their voice dominates U.S. political dialogue and U.S. journalism. Any dissenting views are excluded by the media or met with a storm of abuse. And those views need not belong to the candidate either. Barack Obama was questioned repeatedly over anti-Semitic comments made by Reverend Louis Farrakhan. Farrakhan supports Obama but has nothing to do with the campaign. Do you accept the support of Louis Farrakhan? You know, I have been very clear in my denunciation of Minister Farrakhan's anti-Semitic comments, I think uh, they are uh, unacceptable and reprehensible. Your Jewish support would dry up quicker than a snowball in hell. Tim Russert was really pushing Barack Obama to distance himself from Louis Farrakhan, and Obama did that. As you know, Reverend Farrakhan called Judaism gutter religion. I... Russert wouldn't let that go away. He insisted on continuing to come back and talk about that. What do you do to assure Jewish Americans that you are consistent with issues regarding Israel. Perhaps he might have a different viewpoint than the mainstream, I think, is what they were trying to get at. Does Barack Obama have issues with, uh, with Jewish people? Does he have to meet, for, perhaps, once again, with Jewish leaders to try to reassure them? Well, that's a remarkable statement, considering what he's already said and so on, and it's utterly off the agenda that he would give assurances to the Palestinian community, to other Arab or Muslim communities. John McCain surveyed damage caused by frequent Hamas rocket attacks. When Republican John McCain recently visited Israel, the CNN reporter covering him, to his credit, asked McCain why he failed to go to the occupied territories. McCain's response was telling. Why not spend any time with Palestinians on this trip? They say it's proof to them you wouldn't be an honest broker or that at least until you're president, you're pandering to the lobby back home. Well, uh, they're free to say whatever they want to say. Well, he's trying to send a signal that he is more pro-Israeli than anyone could possibly be. And I think that that's the message that the McCain campaign wanted to send with that, and I think that they were successful. Sometimes journalism is only as good and as impartial as the journalist. One of the main voices of CNN's election and foreign coverage is Wolf Blitzer. Few Americans know it, but Blitzer used to be a lobbyist for the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. You can see a young Blitzer in action on YouTube from a debate in 1989. Israel has all of the justifications in the world to exist. And I don't even think it's, it's appropriate to question the reason why Israel exists. Thank God that there is at least one Israel. Can a former lobbyist for Israel provide impartial, objective reporting for CNN? Would any American news channel ever hire a former Palestinian lobbyist to tell this story? The first question is open to debate. The second one really isn't. And we'll be back here again next week on the Election Post with more on the media and the U.S. elections. 
We're back at the White House, where in January 2009, all the tourists will have an opportunity to gawk at a new resident moving in. The outgoing resident, George W. Bush, is on record saying that he wants to see the creation of a Palestinian state before the end of his term. But with only nine months left, it's really looking like the next president will have to start afresh on the U.S. roadmap to peace. So who among the presidential candidates do Palestinians have their eye on? We went to Ramallah to find out. Hi, my name is Victor Hadi. I'm a Palestinian-American, or an American-Palestinian, I should say. And I am the owner of uh, Zetul Zatar, which means olive oil and thyme. This is our third branch. is in the main street of Ramallah, Palestine. The business is excellent. We also make a, a pastry called Palestine, and it's our, our most selling products. And we sell it because I think uh, when people eat it, they will become more patriotic. Moreover, we make money. As a Palestinian businessman, uh, American politics is very important to us because whoever in the office, uh, in the Oval Office in November, I think, and I hope it's Barack Obama, I think it will change the, the political and therefore the economic situation here. It will bring more peace, it will ease the tension in Iraq and in the, in the region. This is, uh, this is a new pastry by our restaurant. It's called O for Obama and it has all the colors, Zatar for the African Americans, white for the white Americans, for all the colors, because we do believe in the, that America is a melting pot. Yeah. And okay. furthermore, my chef says, if Obama wins, it's because of the Palestinian yeah. Malkusha. Okay. That's it. <laughs> you, you owe me, Barack. You owe me. Inshallah. Owe me. Yeah, let's go. Yalla. And in the, come here. Yalla. It's in the Hollywood oven, Obama wins. Fire it up, Obama, 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 Excellent. Bon appétit. That's all the time we have for this week's show. From Washington, D.C., until next time, so long.